Hi everybody. Um, my name is Dr. O, uh, MD, or uh, you know, people call me Casey. I'm a resident and over here in Detroit, Michigan, in family medicine with a focus in sports medicine. I really appreciate y'all inviting me to do this uh, lecture, um, an interview, just uh, about myself. Um, I've been doing this for quite some time since I've been uh, in residency. Um, I'm open to answering any questions you might have about the medical uh, profession. Um, you know, I also have my own page where I offer other services in addition to, um, you know, answering questions for medical students, pre-med students about, you know, the application process, what to expect for different medical specialties, as well as, um, you know, ways to improve your, yourself and market yourself if you're trying to go into the medical profession. Um, my page also focuses on a lot of different uh, aspects of, you know, health and nutrition uh, for consultations to clients as well uh, in those areas. Um, but um, I'm glad to be here. And um, if anybody has any questions that they want to ask me, you can go ahead and feel free to shoot away. Yeah, so can you just talk about um, why you chose family medicine and just kind of your pre-med journey to medical school? Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, as far as my pre-med journey, so my pre-med journey, uh, technically you could say started when I was in high school. So um, I'm not sure if anybody is familiar with the uh, organization called HOSA. Uh, I did that when I was in high school, had a lot of experience working with different physicians um, and medical professionals. And um, it kind of helped me a lot that, you know, my family members, like my parents were in the medical profession um, stepdad is a psychiatrist, uh, and then he was a former uh, attending physician in a residency, um, and then my mom's an eye doctor, so uh, kind of seeing their lifestyle and uh, kind of what that had to offer urged me to explore more into the medical profession, um, and then when I got into high, uh, the high school, um, I did the HOSA, and then um, believe it or not, when I was in college, I was not a pre-med major. I think that's a really uh, big misconception that you know a lot of the people who um, are become doctors or go into medical school when they're in college um, that they're pre-med majors when that's not the case. Like you know, I wasn't a science major. Um, I actually was a political science major in Arabic and Middle Eastern studies. So I was actually in um, you know liberal arts and. Uh, I studied abroad in Egypt for a little bit, uh, but I still took my prerequisites for um, medical school, studied, um, you know, all the different basic science courses. And then after that, I even did a, you know, small um, graduate program through Georgetown, as well as um, I did another graduate program in uh, public health in Texas. Um, and that's kind of correlated with uh, a lot of what we uh, learned throughout med, med school and even practice in um, residency, uh, especially within family medicine. Um, and then I uh, ended up applying to St. George's University School of Medicine and I got there. Um, it's an American medical school in the Caribbean. And uh, you know, I, I did my basic sciences there and did two years in uh, Grenada. And um, I did a lot of my clinical rotations in different areas from New York to Miami to DC, to Baltimore, um, to meet. Um, so I was around and I got a lot of good experience. And, you know, through my journey, I kind of felt like family medicine offered me the um, expertise and knowledge that I really wanted as a physician and also like the, the freedom and to go into practice in a lot of different areas. I mean, especially I'm, I'm really interested in sports medicine um, so through family medicine, you can do sports medicine, but, uh, what I really liked about family medicine is that, uh, you know, even though for most part, it's often associated with just being an outpatient, you know, you know, family general practitioner, there's a lot of different things you can do with it that people don't really realize. I mean, I've seen family medicine, uh, physicians become, you know, emergency room physicians, uh, they're the ones, they're physicians in the urgent care. And if they're going into 
OB-GYN, some of them are even doing OB-GYN surgeries, uh, adolescent medicine, anesthesia, going into a pain and anesthesia, you know, fellowship and doing that. Um, and in addition to the sports medicine and outpatient orthopedic uh, surgery specialties. So there's a lot of different things with family medicine that you can do. Uh, you work with all different ages. So you, you get a very broad perspective of, you know, lots of different medical conditions and how to treat them and how to approach them. So it makes you feel like you're more of a complete physician, whereas in other specialties, you're, you're, you, you know a lot about a specific region of the body or a specific area, um, but anything outside of that area, it's very, very limited. Whereas with family medicine, you get a very broad um, exposure to a lot of different uh, medical specialties. And even within residency, every month we're, we're switching uh, medical specialties, uh, you know, whether it be in the inpatient setting or outpatient setting. For example, um, my first month of my second year over here in residency, I uh, was in inpatient medicine. So I was on the medicine floors working with people from, you know, admitting patients from the ED and then treating them. It could be anything from diabetes to COVID to um, you know, GI issues to cancer. So, and then the month following after that, I was in the family medicine clinic treating, you know, patients from anywhere from infants to the elderly on a lot of various conditions from diabetes to asthma, to COPD, to well child visits, physicals, uh, neurological issues, hypertension. And then right now I'm in the, actually in the ED, I'm working as an technically as an ED physician this month um, in the ED and uh, urgent care as well. So, um, and then the month following after that, I'll be in the OB-GYN clinic. And then a month after that, I'll be in uh, maybe the pediatrics outpatient clinic. Uh, and, um, you know, I remember even first year, I was working in the outpatient general surgery clinic. Um, and even this year, we'll, we'll be rotating through a lot of different specialties. So you get a, a broad perspective uh, and exposure to lots of different specialties. And you, you're almost like an outpatient specialist in, the, uh, in those areas because uh, as a family physician, you, you get, you, you know, you work with all ages and you're like the first point of contact for people to get referrals for specialists. So that's what I really liked about it. And I'm glad I made the choice. Yeah, thanks so much for answering. Um, I'm not sure if you have a PowerPoint, but you have sharing abilities, just so you know. Okay, I, I have uh, some like case examples I want to go through at the end, but as of right now, I don't have uh, anything. But any other questions uh, anybody wants to ask about you know, me, medical profession, residency, medical school, applications? Yes. Forth. Do you have any like advice? Uh, oh, Michelle has a question. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, I have a question. Um, you said you went to St. George's University. Um, I had been on the fence um, for applying to Caribbean schools because um, I do have a coworker. She's also a doctor, um, you know, at the job that we do. Um, but um, she was telling me she was having the most difficult time, um, you know, transferring like all of her credits and stuff from the Caribbean school and then getting into like, residency and doing because she's done like step two already and I don't know she's just having like a difficult time like most places they didn't want to employ people like with Caribbean medical school students so I just wanted to know like your personal experience with that oh yeah definitely that's actually a very excellent question and I get that question a lot um, the thing you have to keep in mind with Caribbean schools is not all of them are accredited um, but St. George's, fortunately, uh, is um, an accredited um, university, a medical university affiliated with a lot of different U.S. hospitals. So it's an American, um, you know, U.S. affiliated uh, medical school. So it's highly accredited. It's uh, the number one Caribbean medical school, and it's widely recognized. It, you know, we have the most I think most medical graduates out of any medical school in the world. Um, and the thing about that is when you go on rotations, especially in the East Coast, a lot of these hospitals that you rotate with, 
they actually have a strong affiliations with the medical schools uh, from the Caribbean. Um, some of them particularly, I can, I remember when I was in, even in Brooklyn. And the thing about that is, which gives you an advantage is a lot of them like to take uh, residents and accept residents from those medical schools specifically because those medical schools will, are the ones who are kind of reserving the slots for their students to rotate and train there in their third and fourth year of the medical school. Um, so in actuality, uh, it can be a benefit if you're going to some of the medical schools and you're rotating in certain areas of the country. Um, you will, you know, like you, you do have, still have a high chance of matching. Um, obviously, if you're going to um, an American medical school, whether it be an MD or uh, uh, DO school, um, you know, the, the chances of you matching are, are higher. But um, if you're going to one of the top, I would say one of the top uh, three or four uh, Caribbean medical schools, you do definitely still have a chance to, uh, to, to match and transfer your credits as well. In St. George's University, I had, there was, there was no issue in terms of like transferring credits to, um, you know, through the rotations for them to accept it, um, you know, taking the board examinations. So um, in that regard, it, it all depends upon the, the medical school uh, that you're going to uh, in the Caribbean. And even right now in my residency program throughout all specialties, we have a lot of international medical graduates, not even just from the Caribbean, from other countries from India to Africa, Asia, um, and like, you know, East Asia, like it, as long as you, you know, have the proper prerequisites and you take the board exams um, and you, you know, obviously it's gonna, you're gonna have to do um, a lot better. But uh, even right now, I know that uh, their board exam requirements have been changing. I think some of the uh, board exams that I took whenever um, I was applying to medical school, there was a, a, a graded score for it, but now they're moving towards uh, a pass fail system. So just, just, I don't think there's gonna be on some of them, uh, there won't be any um, score associated with it. So it, more, it might be just be more dependent upon how you perform during your third and fourth year in your rotations. So um, as long as you're, you're on your P's and Q's and you're, 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 you're excelling and you're doing your thing and making sure that you're uh, being um, ambitious and dedicated and persistent with your applications, you can land somewhere. Um, so there's no doubt about that. But as far as um, schools you need to go to, make sure if you're going somewhere out, outside of the country, they have some sort of um, affiliation or um, pipeline system where they can kind of um, get you in contact with different hospitals or uh, place you with rotations that you can um, you can rotate in and you can get your experience in and get your credits in. So um, that's my advice on that area. Okay, I have Thank another you. question. Um, how does your like daily work and lifestyle compare to other specialties? And can you explain like what a typical day in your life would be like? Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a good question. I get that a lot too, um, because, you know, from specialty to specialty, your lifestyle is going to vary greatly. Um, if I were a general surgery resident, my lifestyle would be completely different. I wouldn't have as much free time. Um, definitely, you'd be more inpatient working in the OR a lot. Um, yeah, um, there's not a lot of outpatient um, practice with the uh, surgery specialties. Whereas with me, um, as a family medicine physician, like I said, each month, since we're, um, you know, the specialty that has like a broad exposure to a lot of different other um, subspecialties, we rotate uh, and change subspecialties each month. So if we're on an outpatient uh, subspecialty, uh, for example, family medicine clinic or outpatient pediatrics or even outpatient general surgery or orthopedic surgery. It's generally, um, you know, Monday through Friday. Sometimes it'll be on one of those, one or two of those days will be like a half day uh, because of the didactics or, you know, just because these subspecialties closed and then we'll have the weekends off. 
So um, that's really beneficial if you're, you know, a resident, if you, you know, you have a family or have other stuff you want to do outside of residency. Um, you can spend time with friends, family, travel. Um, but then if you're on an inpatient subspecialty, for example, like our first year uh, in residency for family medicine, we had, it's mostly, um, still mostly outpatient, but it's the most uh, inpatient uh, heavy out of the all three years of family medicine residency because we have ICU, uh, two months of inpatient uh, medicine, and then one month of pediatric inpatient medicine, in addition to a month of uh, ED, which you're in ED, you're, you're splitting your time between the emergency room and trauma bay and um, urgent care. Um, but for the most part, in second year, you only have two months of uh, inpatient medicine, and then the majority of all the other months are just outpatient setting, whether it be in the cl family medicine clinic or other subspecialties, and then you'll have in your weekends off. So um, generally, like for example, this this month when I'm in the ED and urgent care, uh, you know, this week I have I had a shift yesterday from about 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And then uh, you know, I had the same thing this today, then tomorrow I have didactics, and then uh, the rest of the half of the day I don't have any shift. So and didactics tomorrow is virtual. Uh, so in didactics is uh, we do our lectures and journal discussions uh, with our within our own uh, residency program with our attendings and other residents in our program from first to third year. Uh, we'll present different topics, discuss them. It's like a learning experience um, and talk about different um, things, whether it be from issues in our clinic, like, you know, addressing billing issues or reviewing some certain things. Um, so that's what's going to happen Wednesday. And then Thursday, I'm actually going to have didactics with uh, emergency uh, medicine uh, residency program virtually uh, from the morning time until about noon um, and then have the rest of the day off. And then Friday, I'll be, uh, is my clinic, my family medicine clinic day. And then um, Saturday, I'll have my uh, urgent care shift. And then Sunday, I'll have off. So that's basically my schedule for, for this week. And then last week, uh, when I was on my family medicine clinic month, it was Monday through Friday, I worked uh, Tuesdays, I had Tuesday mornings, they gave me off to for like study time. So I started seeing patients from like one till, you know, 430 or five. Um, and then every other day was like a full day except for Wednesday, which is that also another half day. So two half days, and then three full days, and then a weekend off. So, um, but, and then when I was in inpatient, I had, I was working about maybe 60 to 80 hours a week on inpatient medicine. We had every five days, uh, we had a call. And first year, our inpatient medicine schedule was every five days call with a 28 hour shift, which was kind of brutal. So the residents really didn't like that um, because that was a new schedule and they kind of got together with all the uh, attendings from the medicine um, residency and said, if the, is there any way we can change that? Because, you know, we're getting exhausted and there's a cap that you can, you can't really work uh, above 80 hours a week, uh, according to uh, ACGME, that's the uh, accreditation uh, council for uh, the residencies here in the U.S. So they changed it. So now our call is every five days. But, uh, you know, we have a morning call resident, uh, which is, or day call rather, from like 7 a.m. till 9 p.m. And then um, the night call person works from 7 p.m. till 11 a.m. the next day. Um, so a lot better, but, you know, still a good amount of hours. You don't necessarily have um, weekends off like you are in, in, in the clinic. Um, but the thing is, the weekends are usually from about 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. And then you, you're you allowed to have at least one day off per week um, when you're on inpatient. So that's in, in, in just like a difference between um, 
month to month schedules when you're on family medicine with me. Um, but this year isn't, hasn't really been too bad. Had a lot of, had, had some time to, you know, catch up on, you know, just studying or working on my other uh, stuff on my page, um, you know, doing other things sports medicine related wise. I'm actually going to be doing a away rotation. We have the option to do away rotations and I'm going to do one in Texas actually in Houston with a sports medicine fellowship program over there uh, associated with uh, Rice University um, and some of the other like, you know, uh, teams over there. So I'm really excited about that. Um, my next question is, do you have any advice on choosing a medical school and um, I guess like, you know, studying in medical school? Yeah, um, as far as uh, choosing a medical school, you definitely want to choose a, a school that you feel like you feel um, secure within the, the learning environment with uh, how they teach, um, the class size, and um, just overall, like the, um, the people around you. Um, you can kind of get a good sense of uh, how the environment's going to be for you. Um, if you feel like you're someone who needs a lot of uh, you know, either space or privacy and, and, and you feel like the environment's not very conducive for you to, to study and thrive, then obviously you know, you best to look somewhere else. But you know you can look at you know places where you feel like obviously you have the best chance to su succeed. Um, if they have any affiliations with the residency programs, right? You look at their uh, their graduation uh, uh, and match rates, and in terms of uh, their training as well in their rotations, where they get to do their rotations. Do you see yourself possibly, you know, being able to live uh, close to uh, wherever that medical school is? Um, if it's a U.S. medical school, because sometimes they'll, they're going to, you know, places around you for residency are going to want to retain you if you're doing rotations there. Um, so those are the main things I would say you should look at um, because all in all, uh, most places offer really good medical training and in terms of, you know, who's going to be a good physician at the end of the day is also dependent upon you and how much work you're, put, you know, willing to put in and how much you're willing to dedicate and sacrifice and be diligent with your studies. So when you get to medical school, I obviously would say that, um, you know, from the very first day, try to learn, um, you know, as much as you can and try to figure out what your learning style is. Um, a huge part of the learning curve with people when they get into medical school is that there's such a huge, like, volume of information that you have to learn in a short amount of time that for some people, it can become like overwhelming. So you really, really have to be um, um, a good a learner and you have to be able to break things down into little pieces to where you can easily digest them and then repeat them over and over again. I like to, I like, you know, I like to give the analogy of, you know, you look at professional athletes and you see what the things that they do day in day out and when they're they're playing their particular sport it seems like it's second nature to them and that's because they've gotten to the point where they've broken down each aspect of their their particular sport into increments that they can digest over and over and they practice that day in and day out it's like they just continue to repeat their fundamentals and go over them over and over again and They've kind of made it to where it's it makes sense to them, and they don't even have to think about it. And that's what you'll see with really good doctors. It's like they have very, very good fundamental understandings of basic principles of their specialty, and that's because they've you know they've understood how they learn best, and then they've been able to break it down into a way that they um, they can easily remember and and teach other people. And I think that's something that's uh, a skill in itself. But, you know, as you go along in medical school and you encounter each subject, uh, you'll become better and better at that. So um, 
that's my advice in terms of like if you're trying to you know become a really good learner and become really good at you know a particular skill in med in medicine just try to make sure you're you're catering it to your own particular um, learning style some people may learn this way and it, it, it sticks for them right but you have to do what sticks best for you okay thanks yeah. um and um how has covid affected your uh practice and have you ever like uh dealt with very difficult patients because you know there's a lot of people who are very um like um like vaccine hesitant and they look at a lot of misinformation so have you like ever dealt with patients like that oh yeah yeah definitely for sure and even when i'm in you know the uh, while i was in the icu or inpatient medicine you know i we'd come down we we get the page oh there's a patient coming in might be covid and then you go and do the history and then you figure out that okay now after the rapid test they're COVID positive when we kind of ask them like, hey, what's going on? Like, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're COVID positive, you have a history of hypertension, diabetes, all the significant risk factors for a person who could get COVID, why didn't you get the vaccine? I mean, they'll be like, oh, no, I didn't, I didn't really believe in getting the vaccine. I don't want it. And even now you, you'll, you know, I sometimes even run into some patients in the clinic where they're having all these different risk factors, and they're still hesitant to get the COVID vaccine. Um, so, I mean, it's a slow change, but you know, fortunately, we, we've been having a lot more people get it. Um, but you know, there's still some people out there that are gonna, you know, you're gonna run into difficult patients in, in you know, every day, like in whatever specialty you're in. You just kind of have to be patient with them. Um, and in terms of like how COVID is changed our practice initially whenever we had the pandemic um our clinic numbers and this is kind of more so like a, a widespread thing uh for people visiting uh, outpatient clinic settings uh it decreased but uh as the year went along and then the vaccine rolled out the numbers started to pick up uh but with that we started to utilize more telemedicine uh, with our practice. And before that, we weren't really using telemedicine, but now it's kind of been um, a very beneficial thing that we could implement in our practice because now patients, if they have any questions or concerns about their health and they want them to have, be addressed, we can address them over the phone and we can even put in orders and medications uh, for different refills or prescriptions uh, at their pharmacy. And we don't even have to be face to face. So it's kind of made uh, you know, patients who were initially more hesitant to speak with a doctor about their different health care issues um, more um, open because now we have like a, like a different line of communication, uh, especially for people over here in the, the Detroit area because transportation is very, very uh, difficult for some people. So sometimes that, that in itself can be an issue for them to uh, get transportation to come to the clinic. But now with tele telemedicine, they don't even have to worry about that. They can call our clinic. We can set up like a video chat. We can talk to them over the phone and address anything that they need uh, in terms of like, if, as long as it's nothing like acute or uh, that needs any type of uh, examination, um, we can address that over the phone. So uh, that's definitely, um, a beneficial change that's kind of come out of COVID. Um, but obviously right now we still have, you know, the social distancing and then um, some sort of, you know, COVID precautions in our hospital that's kind of changed uh, the way that we practice. But uh, overall, it seems like, um, you know, things are starting to get more clear to people and people are becoming more aware about um, the need to um, address their health issues. Okay, and my last question is, well, I know you, you talked about why you chose family medicine, but what would you say are the best parts of your specialty and, your, and the more like, I guess, worst parts? And I know it's like, yeah. And um, if you could change anything about your profession, what would you change? Okay. 
Um, I think I've already spoke about a lot of some of the best parts of my specialty. Um, but as far as I guess the, the worst parts of my specialty um, can also be kind of tied to the best parts because you, in family medicine, you are exposed to a lot of information. So you really, really have to be good at uh, changing gears, changing you know, your speed sometimes, even uh, with our residents, like uh, for example, if you're on an outpatient uh, general surgery, you know, rotation. And, um, you know, in the morning time, you'll, you're, you're seeing patients in the outpatient like general surgery clinic. And then right after that, you have to come back to the family medicine clinic and see the patient. So you kind of have to like switch gears. Uh, there's a lot of information you have to learn. Um, another thing is there's a lot of documentation. Um, that's something that I really don't um, like. And especially with, uh, since we are covering uh, a broad spectrum of conditions, um, yeah, there's a lot of documentation, whether it be for diagnosis, uh, clinical notes, or even billing. That's another, another thing that we, you know, that's really uh, a stickler with our clinic is um, sp specific billing codes that we have to attached to different um, conditions. So um, I think that would be one of the, the main things that I don't like about it. Um, and in general, the lack of, well, this is certain, certain something that's kind of changing though, but the lack of time and individuality that we get to dedicate to patients in the clinic because with family medicine, we have a high volume of patients what we're trying to see in a day. But at the same time, the patients are coming in and we're the first point of contact for them to address all of their medical conditions. So a lot of times, like, you, you, you'll find that like, okay, you know, you have this patient, they're 75 years old, they have hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, thyroid disease, right? They also have a history of a stroke, right? And then they're feeling dizzy, um, tired, drinking, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're peeing a lot, their blood sugar's gone up. So they have like six or seven different issues, but then you have a, a full list of patients that you want to see for the day. So you can't really, you know, spend your entire visit addressing every single issue because that would take like hours, right? Um, and they, you know, a lot of times the patients will be like, I have, you know, I had a, a patient a few weeks ago, he was an elderly uh, man, he came in and he, um, you know, he hadn't seen me in a few months. Um, and, you know, each visit he had been seen by a different resident and he wanted to address to me, he's like, hey, hey doctor, I have a really issue, I mean, I don't know, like, uh, I've been talking, you know, to all these different residents, but I want to have, you know, a dialogue with you. I really want to have established connection with my doctor because I have all these different medical issues, but I don't feel like I have a connection with the doctor. And I, and, and then I could sense is like, you know, his desire to actually want to talk about all these different things that have been going on with them. But, you know, because his time in our clinic every visit is so limited, he really couldn't do it. So what I did is like, hey, I understand what you're doing. Uh, I mean, I understand that you're, you're, um, you're really concerned and I'm concerned too. I really wanna address all your issues. So I'm gonna give you my cell phone number, right? Anytime you have any question or concern about your medications, your condition, you can feel free to you know, message me or call me and I can talk on, on the phone with you over it. You know? And he really appreciated that. So. Um, and that's kind of been um, one of my inspirations to be uh, more open with my patients and also do something what I've been doing with my, my page where I'm having, you know, open, uh, open public conversations with people about you know, healthcare issues and, and being free to people who want, want consultations about different, um, you know, questions about their health or medicine or, you um, just uh, general fitness. So, because I know there's a lot of people out there, um, either they don't have a, a, a connection with their primary care physician, or they just don't have any primary care physician 
uh, at all, but they, there's a lot of questions that they have about health and medicine um, that they want to ask, but they just don't have anybody who can, who's easily accessible. So um, that would be my one uh, definite thing that I would like to see change is that there could be more available access to uh, for patients for you know addressing their healthcare issues um, in different areas, and you'll see that with a lot of clinics are starting to broaden and expand uh, their practice to have you know maybe hiring a behavioral health specialist in there, a nutritionist, um, a mental health specialist, so to kind of like you know uh, lessen the workload that's been placed on uh, the PCP. So, I mean, I think that's, that's something that's uh, definitely going to be beneficial in the future, but uh, as of right now, uh, definitely needs uh, more change. Okay, thank you so much for answering all my questions. I know it was a lot, um, but yeah, do you want to share your presentation with the time you have left? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I just wanted to give everybody an idea of a clinical case that you would uh, possibly encounter in a hospital setting. So I'm going to share my screen and um, can everybody see this? Yeah, you can see it. Okay, good. So this is a really, really good um, website called MedBullets. It's very um, useful for, um, you know, medical knowledge in terms of uh, step two and step three, which are the US MLE boards that you take uh, when you're in the last half of your medical school and then also residency. So it has, you know, a list of different, different uh, medical conditions, their treatments, their pathophysiology and uh, differentials. So I'm just gonna walk you through uh, a case that you can possibly encounter when you're in a hospital and kind of how we approach it from start to beginning. So this case deals with something called a pneumothorax. And if you run into a pneumothorax, so this is how it presents on an x-ray, but we'll go through it little by little. So the case could possibly read something like this. Right, and anytime you have a patient in the hospital, uh, they're going to come in, and you're going to have to collect the history and um, present the history to either attending or um, you yourself are going to have to put in the note. So here's a snapshot of it. You have a 22-year-old man. He presents to the emergency department with chest pain. He was playing basketball when his symptoms suddenly started, and the patient is a tall man and there's no observable trauma to the chest wall. He's hemodynamically stable, meaning like his vital signs have been are stable, and he's currently endorsing pleuritic chest pain. And pleuritic chest pain, meaning that he's having chest pain whenever he's um, breathing out. So you see the x-ray image over here, and pneumothorax is a collapse of the lung. So introduction, you have air entry into the chest cavity that causes collapse of the lung without signs of tension physiology. And with, if you had tens, tension physiology, your blood pressure would be low, which would be hypotension. You would have a high heart rate. And then if you looked up his neck, they would have something called jugular venous distension. So uh, this is what pneumothorax is, right? So it's primarily uh, in terms of primary pneumothorax prevalent in tall and thin men. And uh, risk factors uh, that make you more susceptible to uh, pneumothorax could be if you're, you have a patient who's a smoker, right? And how this usually happens is you have a rupture of a, 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 a bleb in their, their lung, right? So if a patient has emphysema from chronic smoking history, they can have a rupture of this bleb and it can cause a collapse of their lung. And another thing that sometimes you need to consider whenever you have a patient with a particular condition, you have to look at, okay, what po possibly could have caused this condition? And with pneumothorax, it's associated with a lot of different conditions. First and foremost is COPD. If you have a 
person who has a chronic smoking history, asthma, cystic fibrosis, um, infections, whether it be like a pneumonia, um, connective tissue diseases, or even procedures, right? So sometimes people who come into the hospital, they have to have different uh, lines put in um, or procedures. Uh, and that in itself can have um, a high possibility of um, being involved in a, a pneumothorax or if they have a blunt chest trauma. So for example, if a person was uh, in a motor vehicle accident, right? They were on the highway, they were speeding and then they rammed into a wall, um, airbag deploys and they have blunt, uh, blunt chest trauma, that person uh, uh, would be screened for a possibility of a secondary pneumothorax. And with a patient who has a secondary pneumothorax, they usually have a sudden onset of unilateral, meaning a one side pleuritic chest pain and shortness of breath. And whenever we encounter a patient in the ED, we do a physical exam. So they can have, they'll have decreased or absent breath sounds. And they'll have also have uh, on their imaging, uh, tracheal deviation or this JVD where there's basically a, a vein right here that's distended in large, right? Uh, but um, decreased or absent tacked off remitus, that's also another physical uh, exam finding. And the first type of imaging we would order would be a chest x-ray, right? And it would show something like this, right? So you could see, is everybody able to see this? Yes. Okay, so then you can see the, on this area where the pneumothorax is, right? So can everybody appreciate the difference between both sides of these lungs, right? Are you able to see the difference? Uh, one is more cloudy. Exactly. Well, yeah, these are basically the, the, uh, the lung markings, right? So this is how it should be, but if there's air, right, on a radiograph, it will be black. So over here, you're seeing all this black area, whereas over here, the like normal area, it's, you can see the lung marking. So obviously there's a, a, a collapsed area on this region. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Okay, so that's what you would see in uh, pneumothorax, right? But so the x-ray is the best initial test, very quick. You know, in the hospital, you have a portable x-ray machine. Uh, x-ray tech will come down. They'll do the x-ray really quickly, and then it will show that. And But uh, if for any reason the x-ray really isn't clear, you could also do something called a uh, CT. And this is what you would see on the CT, the same type of image, right, from the first one. They're just showing you the CT image of it, right? So on this side, and to kind of understand how a CT is, it's like if you're a person who's laying down on the bed, right, and you're looking for at the person from the foot of the bed, you're looking at their feet. So uh, the CT kind of just takes like a slice from the middle, from top to bottom, and then you'll see your cross section. So this you're seeing the cross section uh, from, uh, you know, their, you know, feet to their head right here, and this is the lung region. So, it's just showing you the area of the collapsed lung. Does everybody understand that? Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, and, and another modality you can use is uh, something called an ultrasound, right? And with the ultrasound, if anybody's ever seen one, it's like a little probe that you hold in your hand and it, it sends signals to kind of let you see um, and appreciate tissue and fluid markings within the body. So this is also another way you can uh, appreciate a pneumothorax. We don't really use it that often in terms of for a pneumothorax, but you know, it can be done. Usually we start off with a chest X-ray and if that's not clear, we can do a CT, okay? Um, and then another and very, very important thing is whenever you have a person presenting with a particular condition, um, you have to make sure you're coming up with a list, a short list of um, other conditions that you have to rule out. So in this case, you know, this person could have a primary spontaneous pneumothorax, uh, a secondary one, or a tension pneumothorax, 
or even a panic attack, surprisingly, because um, pan people who present with panic attacks, they do have, you know, uh, tachycardia means that their, their heart rate can be uh, very elevated, but uh, they're going to lack all these other symptoms, especially with them uh, on the, uh, you know, x-ray. So every time you come up with a, um, a differential for um, a patient who's presenting with a particular issue, um, you have to make sure you're ruling out all the other differentials, okay? And in, per in terms of uh, management, you always start with uh, focusing on the ABCs, and you'll learn this in medical school, airways, right, 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 blood circulation, right, and cardiovascular, so so airway, and you just kind of have to make sure that you're, you know, the person has proper airway, blood circulating, and there's nothing really wrong going on with their cardiovascular issues. Um, if it's a small pneumothorax and they have stable vitals and they're asymptomatic, you can just treat them with 100% oxygen and just observe because sometimes if it's a small pneumothorax, it can just resolve on its own. But if it's a large pneumothorax, what happens is they, uh, we can have something called a needle thoracocentesis. Uh, they can put the needle uh, in their chest cavity and, um, and then they'll put in a chest tube and then that will in itself kind of just make the lung re-expand and you'll hear like a little whoosh whenever you put in that um, needle in a uh, chest tube. Um, but if they have a recurrent pneumothorax, you can do something called uh, pleuridesis, which is just basically an injection of an air into the space. Uh, and then it basically scars the pleural layers together. Uh, so that's basically how you would work up a case from start to beginning, uh, including treatment. Uh, and I just wanted to show that to everybody just so they could kind of uh, understand that. Anybody have any questions? Um, I saw that one of the differentials was uh, primary and then secondary pneumothorax. Right. Like, what would be the difference between them? Like, like from whenever I, I'll show you again. So from here, right? So we talked about the difference between primary and secondary. So secondary pneumothorax, right? So primary is one that just happens spontaneously, right? There's no underlying cause related to it. Whereas a secondary pneumothorax, you would have an underlying cause like a medical condition. Uh, for example, like I said, if a person has a chronic smoking history, they have COPD, that's, that would be due to a secondary pneumothorax if they have a pneumothorax. Or if okay. they're in a motor vehicle accident and they, you know, they had the airbag deploy and hit their chest while they rammed into the wall, that's obviously going to be a secondary pneumothorax. Primary would be something that just happens spontaneously and there's no, um, you know, underlying cause to it. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you so much for coming and answering all my questions. Um, it was really great having you. Yeah, no problem. Does anybody else have any other questions? Um, sorry, I didn't raise my hand first, but um, do you have any advice? Like, this is my second gap year and I'm hoping to start my application process for um, next cycle. I wanna to apply to both DO school and MD school and basically like all everywhere because I have no set place that I like. <laughs> okay, um, in terms of advice and, and applying, I would definitely say that whenever you send in your applications, make sure that you follow up with each school that you're, you're applying to, right? You wanna make sure there's some point of contact within the admissions committee that you can contact and follow up with and make sure that you know uh, they, they're aware of you and, um, and then you're, you're on their mind basically, basically. And you know that uh, they know that you're, you're interested in their program and you're just not just an, another applicant who's just kind of applying there uh, as a backup. And um, if you can uh, try to see if there's at least a few schools that you can kind of maybe visit and go there and maybe 
get in contact with a either medical student or even a, a resident uh, and see if there's a way you can maybe like maybe even shadow for a day or uh, talk to some of the people on the admissions committee or even the students there, right? Um, because you want to make sure that, you know, you're showing some sort of initiative uh, and interest in the, the medical school that they know who you are and kind of sets you apart from a lot of other people. And uh, I mean, I think that can actually go a long way. Even when I was applying a residency, like that's one of the things that actually helped me when, when I got into this residency is that I, um, I called the, the program coordinator uh, for our residency program. And then I talked to her and I expressed my interest in, in, in the program after I sent an application and then I called again and she saw that I was, you know, very, very interested in the program. And then when um, I came here for the interview uh, and the interview was actually in the clinic. So they wanted to, they did that for a very specific reason because when we were in the clinic, it kind of gave them an idea of how we would not only interact with all the, the faculty, but also the patients as well. So when they saw me like um, interacting with the patients, um, believe it or not, they actually, you know, asked the patients like, hey, what did you think about that guy? Like, so how you're interacting with people and your interpersonal skills and how outgoing you are and showing your initiative, that can actually go a long way with, uh, you know, the uh, application process, whether it be for medical school or a residency, because that's a, actually a very important skill that you need to have whenever you're a physician. So be persistent, follow up with your, your programs. If you can kind of connect with any program contacts, whether it be a, a faculty, a resident or a medical student from that program and maybe even shadow them or just go and visit the campus, then uh, I would highly recommend that, even if it's just a few places. Any other questions? Anybody else have any questions about the uh, application process, me, my page, specialties? Um, I don't think anyone else has any questions. So um, thank you again for coming and uh, showing us through that case. Yeah, yeah, no problem. And uh, feel free to follow my page at Dr. OMD. And if you have any other upcoming questions when you're going into the application process, you can feel free to DM me or um, I can even give you my, uh, my assistance on email or um, IG, her name is Yamna. She's actually a pre-med student too. So she's been working with me and you can message her and she can relay the message to me. All right, thank you. Have a great rest of your day. All right, thank you, you too.